it's good to see so many of you here today for the next in our online talks any of them that you've missed you can catch up with them on the library's youtube channel youtube.com forward slash wcm library and today's talk will be uploaded there shortly as well we'd like to welcome alison fell our speaker who is professor of french cultural history at the university of leeds and she was chair of the steering group for the Legacies of War 1914 to 18 to 2004 18, which was a series of research projects and outreach activities with over 50 partners in Yorkshire. And her topic for us today is the Legacies of Wartime Strikes Interwar Women Trade Union Leaders in France and Britain. Our talks are as usual free, however we would like to encourage you to support the library if you are able to do so. And a reminder that there's a donate button on our website. Okay, I will just start Alison's presentation. Or not. <laughs> there we go. And just to say, if you want to hide the speaker, you can do that. If you look at the little pictures on the right, you could, you've got things at the top where you can hide the, the thumbnail video or you can just see the small active speaker. So I'd encourage you to explore those and use them as you wish. And I'll go hopefully to slideshow mode. It's taking its time. I'll try that again. There you go. Okay, Alison, over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lynette. Um, so thank you to everybody for coming, as it were. Um, it's the first time I've actually done a talk like this, although I have been doing some online teaching since lockdown. Um, so I'm a bit familiar with this kind of thing, but uh, forgive me if um, uh, I, uh, I'm a bit slower than I might be with the questions and things at the end. So when I first agreed to do this talk, it was obviously before lockdown, before coronavirus, but I've been thinking that in many ways there are some more rather than fewer parallels with the period I'm going to be talking about today and what's happening around us. I think this is particularly the case with, um, as a society, thinking about which skills and which workers are seen to have most value and which are, both, which are most needed by the state in a time of national emergency. So at the moment, key workers, whether that's drivers or cleaners or bin men or supermarket staff or food production workers, who are often invisible or dismissed as low skilled are now recognized and even celebrated. To some extent, I think the same was true during the First World War. In both the First World War and now, for example, the necessity and value of nurses work was particularly recognized and both nurses and doctors were heroized. So uh, I've looked, for example, at monuments created for nurses who died in the um, flu, Spanish flu in 1918 and 1919. The war also made female um, industrial workers more visible than they had before. And their work was sometimes praised or sometimes included in propaganda material. However, it tended to be seen as a temporary measure or a necessity in a national emergency rather than indicating longer term shifts in attitudes. So this is kind of what I want to be talking about today really, is uh, some of the impacts of war work on uh, female industrial workers and how that did or didn't impact uh, the 1920s. So if I could have the first slide. So sometimes it's assumed that women workers in the First World War, most often perhaps seen as a, a female munitions worker, were all um, uh, sort of at home, not working before the First World War, which is of course not true. Both the countries I want to be talking about, I'm going to be talking about today, France and Britain, had high levels of waged female labour in industry before 1914. So in France, the 1906 census said that women accounted for about a third of the industrial labour force, which had increased to over 40% by the end of the war. And in Britain, um, in um, uh, 1915, female employees in the total workforce made about 26%, that increased to about 47% in 1918. 
But what did certainly happen in the war was a shift from different sectors. So if women were, um, that there was, for example, around 1.4, 1.5 million British women who might have entered the workforce in the war, but lots more women moved from one sector to another. Perhaps one of these most well-known shifts is a, a move away from domestic service and its long hours and low pay in favour of some of the better paid war jobs that were available. And of course, in addition, the mobilisation of men and the massive state machinery needed to keep the army fighting opened up new opportunities. And as you can see from um, the slide, and this is taken from a BBC um, educational resource, one of the biggest increases was actually in clerical work um, uh, for the civil service. But there were, as you can see, also um, increases in industrial work available, for example, in the metal industries. So I'm going to talk more particularly today about female industrial workers who led strikes or episodes of industrial unrest during the war in 1917 and 1918. And just, can I just have the next slide? This is research I did that's included in a, in a chapter of a book I published um, in 2018, in which I was looking at how war service impacted women's lives in the 1920s and 30s, asking whether women who'd been on different forms of um, active service or war work were able to use that for social mobility, to broaden horizons, to gain new skills, as was the case for some men. So to some extent, industrial war work could be seen as a form of war service involving a degree of sacrifice. So in left-wing political and trade union circles, people could make, sometimes make claims about the workers' patriotic sacrifices on the factory floor in contrast to what was seen as selfish individualism of some factory owners or managers who were presented as shirkers or profiteers which was the way um, the sort of terms used to kind of demonise people to, who weren't seen to be contributing to the national emergency, to the war effort. In France, as John Horne and other historians have said, French munitions work, workers, it was said, were playing what was called the blood tax, the ample de sang in the French con context, which was their way of contributing to the war effort instead of the more usual blood tax of uh, joining the army and uh, risking your life. But the workers who participated in the uh, hundreds uh, of episodes of industrial action in 1917 and 1918, this complicated um, this, this understanding of, of industrial war workers as sort of performing um, patriotic duty. Many saw strike activity during the war as a threat to national defence at a time when a nation's survival was at stake. Strikers were often portrayed as dangerous revolutionaries or as those sort of infected by foreign political um, ideas. So when, when I was looking at some of these female strike leaders for my book and, and asking what happened to them after the war, I was very interested in which aspects of the war, their war experiences they presented in their speeches um, and other writings um, for different audiences. And what I found and what I'm going to talk a bit about today was they could sometimes position themselves as having patriotically contributed to the war effort via their work, but their leadership of episodes of industrial action tended to only bring them a degree of credibility and sort of cultural capital when they were talking to socialists, trade unionists and uh, communists in the years following the armistice. So I was kind of interested in what they did, how that impacted their lives and their careers, and also how they talked about it. So I'm going to give you a little bit and two case studies from that book today. So can I have the next slide? So just, I'm sure many of you know this as well as I do, but war work in industry wasn't without its risks. Several hundred female munitions workers died from explosions or toxic poisoning. More commonly, women died from industrial accidents. So this is just one case, Margaret Valentine from Manchester, who died because she fell into a vat of corrosive liquid. This was a, um, quite common 
Um, obviously, there were industrial accidents before the war as well, and yet she's remembered as having died on active service um, in the Imperial War Museum's women's work collection. Um, it also should be said that for most factory workers during the war, as had been the case, of course, in the pre-war years, industrial labour involved long hours of monotonous and strenuous um, repetitive tasks. Um, wages were still lower than those of men and didn't come up, didn't keep pace with the rising cost of living, especially from 1916 onwards. Um, but they were higher than they had been pre-war, um, especially for some women who'd moved from a different sector. And there were some patchy reforms, for example, there was some state provision for childcare because mothers needed to work as well as single women during the war. But in practice, the kind of factory crash were um, both um, were, were very few in number and only really helped uh, a small percentage of women workers. Um, the influx of women into these industrial roles didn't also end, uh, end gender divisions of labour on the factory floor. And this was one of the contexts that was important for the strikes. So um, there's a historian called Laura Lee Downs, and she's looked at the metal industries during the war in France and Britain. And she argues that employers, quote, reorganised productive hierarchies and allocated tasks between the sectors in accordance with their understanding of the ways in which male-female difference manifested itself on the assembly line or at the, the machine. So in other words, um, me, what men, men and women did in industrial settings didn't necessarily change. There was in some ways a strengthening of existing inequalities with decisions about rates of pay um, closely related to very gendered understandings of levels of skill. So can I have the next slide? These, these kind of contexts, that helps to explain why there was uh, a number of strikes towards the end of the war in 1917, 1918. I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about why there were so many strikes in those years in a bit. But it's important to say that quite a large percentage of these strikes not only involved female workers, but were also led by women, some of whom had been involved before the war, but for many of whom, was an initiation into industrial action for the first time. So these female strike leaders acted as spokespeople for other workers, negotiated both the union leaders if they weren't organised, factory owners, politicians, as well as the mediators commissioned by the governments in both France and Britain to act as arbitrators. The, the two case studies I'm going to talk about today, and it's a case for a, a sort of although a small, a small cohort, a few other women that I looked at for my book, it led to longer term political careers in the post-war years, something that was very rare and difficult for working class uh, women. So the years 1917 to 1921 were obviously not just about the war. There were other political developments that were having an impact on employer-employee relations. Um, particularly the, the Russian Revolution, splits in pre-existing socialist group, groupings, formation of the PCF, the French Communist Party, and the Communist Party of Great Britain in 1920. And all of these developments helped to shape the way that women understood their labour and the relationship to production, but also provided some new opportunities for leadership for a few of the women who'd led some of the strikes. So my first case study is a French woman who gained a leadership position in the French Communist Party and Communist Union because she'd led an episode of industrial action during the war. So in terms of the situation in France, there were similarities between both nations, but 1917 was a particularly key moment. Before that, um, obviously, France was in a different position from Britain in that it had been invaded, it was occupied, um, so the, the very survival of nation was, 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 the nation was very clearly at stake during the war. So most socialists had supported the government. But in, 19, in January 1917, 
Um, there was an introduction of a Thomas scale of wages in factories introduced by the Minister of Munitions to raise the minimum rates of pay for both sexes and to rationalise the calculation of peace rates. In spring 1917, many employers in France were refusing to implement this new scale in spite of wartime inflation, which had cut wages in real terms by about 23%. So employees were becoming increasingly desperate and dissatisfied and this coincide, coincided with a shift in public morale in relation to the war more broadly. So um, it coincided with some mutinies in the army which are perhaps best seen as a form of strike in the, in the trenches and generally people, some people starting to call for a negotiated peace. So, um, the, the, the grievances amongst the factory workers um, led to a real wave of strikes. So in 1917, for example, there were nearly 700, um, nearly 300,000 people going on strike, which was more than double 1916. The tone and, and the nature of the strikes shifted sometimes with them becoming a bit more politicised in some regions of France. Um, um, so sometimes they were very focused on paying conditions in a particular factory and sometimes they were about broader issues. So if I could just have the next slide. So this is an anonymous letter from a French female munitions worker from 1917 saying we're all responsible for families but while the men working alongside us earn a lot more the cost of living is as high for us as it is for them. No, it's not with injustices like this that the woman will pay her blood tax. This is, um, again, I mentioned the blood tax as, as this suggestion that it's women's contribution to the war effort. Um, and often women strikers talk about this double sacrifice, that they're both the relatives of men at the front and suffering themselves on the factory floor with their um, pay and conditions. I'm gonna have the next slide as well. This is an example of a strike that became more politicised, although I have, it, have, as I said, they weren't all like this. This is in a large munitions factory. Uh, this is from a police report. Um, so the workers stopped work and protested inside the factory, trying to call out support from other workers. They refused to start work and about 200 of them went into the streets, seeing the Internationale, the Marseillaise and the Pina. No man took part and the women were very inflamed. Two of them had made improvised, improvised flags out of handkerchiefs attached to the end of a stick. They danced and yelled, our prelude, it's the nickname for a French soldier, give us back our prelude, down with war, we want peace. So some of the strikes, as you can see, had a political tone to them. Okay, can I have the next one? So, um, I'm now going to move on to, to, to my uh, case study, Alice Bussey. So, she... Um, led a strike in 1917. It's one of the most famous strikes uh, in France, which was a strike of the dressmakers, or the Nizinette was their nickname in French. Um, it was highly mediatised, and you can see I've got a, a press illustration there as well as a photograph. And it was initially triggered in April 1917 by the redundancy of two workers in the textile industry who were told they weren't needed for a Saturday afternoon shift. In response, um, uh, some workers went out on strike demanding a full day pay for working on Saturdays and an extra franc a day for the rising cost of living. The strike quickly spread, uh, the number of strikers rising to around 2,000 the following day, and eventually the whole garment industry ground to a halt with over 30,000 workers on strikes. This was the dress, textile, fur and leather industries, very important in Paris. Uh, with a high percentage of female workers. So the demonstrators took to the Parisian streets um, and um, they were very uh, successful because their demands were met. So for 23-year-old Alice Brissy, it was initiation into trade union politics and industrial action that changed the course of her life. It was her first ever strike. She ended up becoming one of the leaders. In an interview many years later, she presented it as um, highly significant in the direction that her life took afterwards. She talks about the strike 
in um, ways that show the links to the ideas about war service and sacrifice that I was referring to before. So she says, for example, quote, everybody in the factory had a relative at the front and every morning the first question people asked was, have you any news? Paris offered us the double spectacle of hunger because we were, had ration cards for bread and sugar and immoral luxury. The wives of the profiteers and the nouveau riche were our most demanding and capricious clients. So she's talking there about what's sometimes called a hierarchy of sacrifice, this idea that in a time of national emergency, people's different contributions are judged in these measures and she finds you know that the, the sort of wealthy still wanting their furs made correctly to be wanting in comparison to what they're offering on the factory floor so she as a 23 year old Alice Clusey would not necessarily have had um, the possibility of um, having a political career but this strike made all the difference um, the close links with it endowed her with a degree of political authority in left-wing political circles in the interwar years. So she joined the newly formed French Communist Party in 1920 and took on very important roles, a series of um, national and regional roles in a period in which both communism and trade unionism were dominated by men. She benefited in particular from attempts in the early years of the French Communist Party to recruit more female members. But in her interventions in the 1920s congresses of the Communist Union that she was part of, we can sense, sense her growing frustration at a kind of lack of commitment to take female industrial workers and their demands seriously. So if I can have the next slide. So she felt that um, the, her male comrades were, not, uh, were still hindered by what she saw as outdated male views. So I'll read the full uh, intervention that she made, although I've got part of it on the slide, and that's a later photograph of her. Um, we've emphasised and need to emphasise here the fact that even amongst trade union members, certain prejudices remain. Our male comrades don't really realise that the current situation of women workers is a definitive one. Women will be increasingly industrialised. Comrades who still hold to the outdated principles that women are made to stay at home and men must demand, must demand higher salaries to support their families are mistaken. The bourgeoisie have been fond of saying that women are indifferent, that their brains are too small, that they're passive, not interested in the realities. Um, of life, or if they were interested, it wasn't for them, or we mustn't repeat what bourgeois morality has taught us. So Alice Brousseau was making arguments that were quite rare in the period in which she was talking. She's arguing that women shouldn't be seen as a special case, but just as workers who deserve equal pay for equal work. This goes against the dominant breadwinner model in, that in which male union leaders and French union leaders were certainly no exception, prioritised what they call the family wage for skilled male workers, uh, which would allow women to, um, especially obviously married women with children, to not work. But Brice could make these kind of controversial comments because she commanded a degree of respect to, because of her activist background and especially her extensive experience of industrial action alongside other women in the war. When she was elected onto the Parisian committee, um, she was praised in the following terms. The Paris region thinks that Alice Plissé, who has long experience of struggle, really knows the working classes because she's worked and suffered alongside them. Of all of us, she's the most capable of speaking on our behalf and expressing ideas. She knows how eloquently she speaks of exploitation because she's suffered herself. So the French Communist Party was quite short of working class women who could be seen as authentic mouthpieces for the struggles of the, working, um, of the working classes. They did have some middle-class women who had leadership positions, but one of the reasons that Alice Plissé got that sort of rose through the ranks was partly because of her experience in the war and partly because of her authentic uh, working class roots. But the French Communist Party 
despite the enthusiasm of female activists, like we say, wasn't very successful in recruiting more female members. And the unionization of women workers, despite having risen from a very low base during the war, remained relatively weak in the interwar period. So um, communist, socialist and trade unionists in France remained committed to the dominant breadwinner model. However, um, there were cer certain women who did use their war experiences as an opportunity to become prominent activists in their political circles. And this is actually true on the far right, um, which Alice Bézé often talks about in union congresses, as well as in communist and trade union circles. So women like Alice were able to speak regularly in public, write articles for the political press and help shape the direction of policy. Um, and it was because of the kind of political education she underwent during the war years. So I'm now going to just turn to my British case study. I hope I'm doing okay for time, yes. Um, so the situation in, in Britain regarding the situation of uh, women workers and trade unions did share many of the same characteristics. So the frequency of strikes also increased in 1917 and 1918, although the political context was somewhat different. Many of the strikes involved or were led by women workers, and often, as in France, the nature of the strikes differed from those led by men. The largest numbers of unionised women workers, and I know some of you will know more about this than me, um, belonged to the general rather than the skilled unions the Workers' Union, the General Union of Municipal Workers, and the National Federation of Women Workers. Um, union membership rose steeply during the war, from about 437,000 in 1914 to 1 1.3 million in 1920. And although it fell again, unionisation remained higher than it had been before the, the war. Um, so in the incidents of industrial unrest in 1917 and 1918, women were involved in negotiating with employers and managers and politicians in a bid for improved wages and, and conditions. One of the ways that we can see this negotiation is through arbitration brought in by the government to ensure the continuation of production during wartime. Um, and we can we have some of these records in the National Archive. So if you just go to the next slide, I'll talk very briefly about one of them. So this is a letter from the Women Weavers of Cumlidge Mills in Duns in 1917, which shows a very similar rhetoric to the case I was talking about in France. Um, so this is a group of women who were in a blanket factory who went out on strike. Um, they wrote collectively to Sir George Atwith, who was the chairman of the Government Arbitration Committee. Um, and they also play on the um, stereotypes of sacrifice versus kind of profiteering and shirking bosses. And this is one of my favourites, so I'll read you it. It says, we are women weavers and many has a house to keep up with their brothers and other friends fighting in France. One of our masters is lying in a helpless state with drink the other master tends to go motoring for golf and leaves us struggling on. They don't know what the war is, and they don't even ask for the men that are away fighting. We are only fighting for a just cause, for our wages. So I find it interesting, partly because of this boss who's just playing motoring to play golf, but also because it's such similar rhetoric, this idea that this is double sacrifice, that they both have got relatives at the front and they're women on the factory floor. So I just want to um, finish my talk by with British Case Study, which is one of the female organisers who worked for the Workers' Union, which represented by 1920 around 100,000 women workers. So at the start of the war, the Workers' Union only employed one female organiser, but uh, in 1915 and 1916, a further 19 were recruited uh, and they represented around a quarter of the union staff in 1918. A bit like the French Communist Party that I looked at, they were careful to employ women organisers with working class credentials who they believed would appeal to and be able to effectively recruit women workers. And I've drawn here on Cathy Hunt's work, who organises that, who sorry, shows us that women organisers were not on an equal footing with their male comrades 
and that the union's interest in women workers were largely in terms of their potential to strengthen it in terms of numbers and finances. But the, the um, work as an organiser did give some working class women rare opportunities to enter the public sphere, speak in public meetings, negotiate in episodes of industrial unrest and construct a political life after the war. So if we could just go to the next slide. So this is uh, Rose Wyatt or Rosina Wyatt as she uh, renamed herself. So this is um, a not very good copy of a photograph, I'm sorry, from the union newspaper, The Workers' Record. They regularly published biographical sketches of um, uh, organisers, including the women organisers. And this dates from 1923. She's an interesting case study because we have a potted biography of her in the uh, newspaper. She then also wrote a short memoir part of which was published in 1974 in John Burnett's edited collection of working class life writing, and part of which is in the Warwick Record Centre. So this is what I drew on. So when the article's talking about what she's achieved by 1923, it mentions that she uh, led a strike at a munitions factory, and then in 1918, a further strike at a blanket mill. It also mentions that she became very ill from TNT poisoning, um, and, and which is sort of reminiscent of a lot of the male union leader biographies in which their war services and sacrifices are referred to. Um, I do find it quite interesting to compare both the newspaper, the union newspaper, and John Burnett's um, introduction of her, and then her own memoir, because there are differences in the way she presents her, presents her life. Um, she writes in the third person, calls herself Jenny, and she emphasises in her memoir the extent to which the TNT poisoning she suffered, the hard, hard work, poor conditions and risk to life should be recognised as valuable war service. So if you get to the next slide, I think it's my last slide. This is from her autobiography. They were called the Chorland Canary, so she worked at a munitions factory. There was an explosion actually in March 1918 in which four of her... Um, colleagues were killed. But this is this is the well-known uh, nickname of munition as, as canaries. They were called the Chorland Canaries. Even the bed linen became yellow. Jenny found that she had to pay her landlady more money for the laundry, especially for the feather bed, and felt a little incensed by this. After all, she was helping the war effort, helping the lads at the front. So she notes with pleasure the fact that she was recommended for, for an OBE by her employers, um, and that songs were sung in her honour. And uh, I, I kind of, so her war service forms part of her narrative in a way that it didn't for many of the women that I looked at. She also talks about how important her initiation into the labour and trade union movement was as an opportunity for education and self-advancement. So she'd been um, a living domestic servant before the First World War. Um, and this is what she says about working in a, in a munitions factory, despite the hard conditions. In the munitions factory, Jenny had a feeling of complete freedom, time to think. When she was in domestic service, she'd always felt a driving force of something unexplainable. unexplainable. She attended lectures, bought books, studied economics and social life and welfare. She learned fast and furiously. So it's interesting that we get the sort of possibility of uh, social mobility and education uh, as being on the factory floor, as well as the, the difficult conditions that she was in. Whereas she's, uh, she's described as naive in the 1974 publication, and uh, she's also uh, described as um, having true working class roots, I think, in the, in the working class newspaper. But she shows herself to be politically savvy in her memoir. She has an awareness of the extent to which um, uh, there were existing inequalities between male and female organisers, for example. So she said, um, I found myself in a different world with different responsibilities, but one thing I felt was, was unfair was the women officers were never given an area or district of their own to organise and develop, for all their work was placed in branches controlled by male officers, and of course, women had less wages. So she's kind of able to see that even though she believes in the movement, there are still existing inequalities within the union that she works for. 
I did a bit of research into her life, and it's interesting that none of the versions of her life mentioned that she was illegitimate, but she was, even in the, by the 1960s, perhaps she had to present herself as uh, socially respectable. Um, but when you look at the uh, lives of her half siblings, they all had very limited social mobility, um, as well as geographical mobility. So compared to looking at her will, for example, um, and who she left money to and the organisations and the associations that she was uh, part of. She, for example, she was a governor, she was the mayor of Camberwell at one stage. You can see that the war was a springboard for a different life for her, leading to her, her to engage in different networks and having a political career that clearly differentiates her from her siblings. So I think my time's up. I'll just briefly conclude to say that um, in their speeches, interviews, letters and memoirs, the French communist woman and the British workers union organizer that I've talked about today were able to speak to and for other working class women in a way in which male colleagues or indeed other middle class female colleagues could not. The war provided them with, a, with the planks to build platforms on which to stand as representatives of women workers. But interestingly, in the 20s, only Rosina Wyatt was able to refer to her war service as a key factor in their credentials, whereas Alice Brise rarely did unless she was talking to very specific audiences. I think this is because of a different in, difference in national context. Um, in Britain, Wyatt was able to claim the, uh, the identity of a kind of veteran of the war, but in France, the wartime strike action was still very controversial and ambiguous and very difficult to, to talk about in the 1920s. So her claim to a status as being a kind of war veteran um, remained muted and shaky. Both women, however, um, emphasised their working class backgrounds and their unique understanding of working class women, um, even if um, in both cases they were only able to make limited progress in unions and organisations so dominated by men. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed, Alison. And um, people who are our Zoom regulars have already found the reactions button to give you some, uh, some now newly traditional um, muted applause. <laughs> Thank you very much, folks. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. So we, uh, we would like to encourage you, if you have a question or a comment, to use that chat function, which is um, down at the bottom of my screen, certainly. And uh, we've got a couple of questions already, so that's, that's great. Can you, can you see them, Alison, or do you want me to read them out for you? No, I can see them. Um, so the first one from Maggie, did you find any links between women strikers and pre-war suffragists and suffragette activities in Britain? Yes, there were links. I was quite keen on looking for case studies for women who hadn't been active before the war, so I could really see the kind of, um, whether the war was an initiator for them. But um, yes, um, I suppose in uh, terms of the, the, the sort of political circles that people were moving in, there were close connections to some uh, suffragist associations uh, and then after the war to some pacifist associations and so women who through their industrial action became politicized and joined either you know the IOP or the the, the communist party or uh, then they tended to then to start to mix in those networks that they hadn't done pre-war. In France of course women didn't actually get suffrage um, and so the, the, the movement was rather rather different in France um, but yeah you can see the same sorts of connections and the same interlocking circles of these of these networks of activists yeah in both countries and um, the next question uh, so were most of the women taking action at this time working in sectors that they'd only joined because of the war or were many still fighting for improved conditions in their traditional places of work from before the war that's an excellent question um, I was looking at war work only for my book, but it was clear that when I read through a whole, for example, the workers' union journals, that um, 
there were some women who were, became organisers who'd been involved in strikes uh, before the war. And so it was a kind of continuation. I mean, the kind of the links between war work and pre-war work and then post-war work are often there's more continuity than you think and we sort of bracket the war off quite a lot but as I said sometimes it was a case of only moving between one sector and another and sometimes there was women sort of just continuing different jobs but it was now called war work just like actually some women who um, joined the auxiliary services for the British Army during the war were still doing so as cooks or cleaners just in a uniform so sometimes kind of I think there were women who'd been politically active and fighting for better conditions before the war who found the war gave them new opportunities obviously more women workers more women members and um, fewer men around I guess and so that the war was a greater opportunity for already politicized or activist women but I was also looking at women for whom the war was definitely an initiation into that for the first time as well. Oh, lots of questions. Um, okay, in Manchester, there was a uh, Women's War Interest Committee, most specifically, was there anything similar in France? Thanks, Ali, Ronan. <laughs> well, I can't quite see you, but I know Ali. Um, so, um, it was a bit, it, it's, there's not a short answer to that question, not quite, but there were some similar types of committees um, through some different uh, associations and organisations. So although not identical, yes, broadly. And we can have a chat about that perhaps another day. There's lots of questions. Um, do you look at how war service affected nurses after the war before nurse registration? Yes, <laughs> nurses um, are all over my book. Uh, I spent many years being fascinated by nurses. I looked at nurses who became political activists and, um, uh, for example, pacifist activists after the war. I also looked at a couple of nurses who joined the British Fascist Party. So, you know, nurses did all sorts of interesting things after the war who didn't remain nursing. I also did look at um, some of the links between war nursing and then state registration or generally the sort of public responses to nursing as a skilled profession. Um, so, yes. Um, there's, a, there's a question just come through um, separately uh, rather than to everybody, so I'll just read it out. Did some of the women union leaders become significant political activists in the 20s? Yes, some of them did. I mean, as I would try to say, I think that they still probably, you know, there were still slight limitations on what they could do and what they could achieve. But yes, absolutely. Um, and within the opportunities that there were. So some of them would be on sort of specific conditions, committees looking at women um, as opposed to taking on sort of major leadership positions. But uh, there were definitely women who went on to have uh, long lasting political careers. Um, so how much the lack of men available after the war enable women organisers to continue? Um, well, I haven't looked longer into the 1930s at this, but um, the women organisers that I looked at, yes, did continue in their roles after the war. But obviously, as the interwar years rolled on, the economic slump had a large impact on the unions. Uh, there were, in, you know, the strike numbers, as you might have seen from my graph, went up. Um, so, um, the, they, they did continue the war, the context shift, shifted, um, but it didn't mean that when the men returned from the war, all the women who had been involved in union roles suddenly had to, to step back and let men go into them. So in that sense, yes, they were able to continue. Alice Brise was, um, she wasn't a paid organiser, but she was a leader, a union leader, so she was paid. It was just a slightly different role. So she led a, a regional section of the union. So in fact, Alice Brise was woman, one of the women who had the most impressive uh, raft of leadership positions in the, in the French Communist Union, as well as being a prominent member of the Communist Party. They were kind of hand in glove. Um, but what happened to Alice Brise is that she sort of fell out with the, there were lots of kind of internal splits in the French Communist Party in the later 1920s and 1930s. And uh, she 
fell out of favour um, with, with in, in the later 20s. Um, so she didn't, her leadership didn't sort of continue right through the interwar period. Um, did you find any examples of women taking over jobs traditionally seen as men's work? Yes. So there were definitely women doing jobs that had only been done previously by men, including some really heavy industrial labour. And I think if you go on to the Imperial War, if you're interested in this, the Imperial War Museum has some wonderful interviews that you can just access online, as well as some wonderful photographs. The only thing I would say, I suppose, is that quite a few historians who have specialised in this I think say that we need to be careful about what was photographed at the time, what was given a lot of publicity and what was going on in the background. So a bit like now, this is why I think it's an interesting time to look at now, you know, there were some workers who perhaps weren't photographed, you know, and, and, and were still working. Um, so although we have a, some amazing records of women carrying out jobs that would have been seen as remarkable for women to do, we do have to remember that the ones that were filmed or photographed or noted upon were sometimes done with an agenda in mind in a way to heroize them to show how marvelous they are temporarily standing in for the men and um, so sometimes certain women roles were sort of highlighted and um, there's an absolutely fabulous film that was made by the french state of women's war work which is also freely available online just email me if you want to look at it in which there's very very clear kind of aims that they're going to show the, the most unlikely, if you like, jobs women doing, it, precisely to show, and the, the, the subtitles of the silent film are all about how women are, are, are going beyond what would be expected of their sex in order to work for their patriotically, you know, work for the nation. So, yes, definitely there were women doing men's jobs, but we need to be careful about the records of that, I think. Um, the National Shop Steward Movement is supposed to equal pay the rate for the job in engineering, albeit this was motivated more by the desire to protect the male rate at the end of the war when they assumed hope when we leave. Luke, you say more about this. Thank you, Ralph. I'd be happy for Luke to say more about that if he knows more about that. It's possible that's just a quickly typed thing, it's, and, and it's uh, kind of. Uh, is there anything you can say about it? Um, I'm just, well, I'm um, I obviously um, noted, I suppose, briefly that the skilled unions maintained their refusal to accept women into the unions longer than the, um, the workers' union that I looked at did. So I think that the supporting of equal pay is slightly complicated by this this gendered understandings of skill that I was talking about. So um, I think that, yes, I'm sure that there was equal pay supported, but as you absolutely suggest, it's kind of complicated by their understandable desire not to let wages be driven down um, by changing the rates of pay in, in, in to, to some skill level. So I think it's complicated between gender and the notion of skill levels that the whole question of, of pay and equal pay really. Um, yes, thank you Chloe, absolutely. That's what I was saying, but you said it much more concisely. <laughs> um, did women in the union show solidarity with those in other countries? Yeah, in fact, the thing I didn't get, one of the things I found a lot in the French records of looking at Alice Police and I looked at two other women as well, um, was that they, in the later 1920s, there was quite a lot of uh, visiting to, the, to Russia um, and uh, a lot of close contact. Um, and they were very keen for uh, France to show that they had women like Alice and, and a couple of others that I looked at who genuinely were working class women from the factory floor. So they, um, they were very keen to take these women on the trips to Russia to sort of show that, you know, they were because they needed women who had that authenticity but interestingly the only way one of them actually got a passport was by pretending to be somebody's domestic servant uh, so the <laughs> but uh, the, 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 it was, there really was quite close contact and also sometimes for example in 1927 there was a big week of activities amongst the communist union celebrating the russian women's 
protests in 1917, which were really a kind of bread riot, you know, going on the streets, um, which was sort of interesting that the, the, the Russian Revolution and the associated activities in Russia became uh, a, a point of commemoration and um, a point of sort of focus as much as the, the dates of, of the, the, the war within France. So yes, lots of interesting connections. Annie Pimelot, Stockport organizer. I'm afraid I don't have any facts about her. Maybe some other people in this knowledgeable audience might do. Yes, yes, Arthur Henderson. Yeah, my boss at the university is a specialist in Arthur Henderson. So uh, I will ask him, <laughs> Andrew Thorpe, who's just, who's just been appointed at Leeds, who's uh, writing a biography. So he's a, he's a, a source of authority. But yes, yeah, so yeah, we have some great examples in the library collection of, uh, of delegations to, to Russia, some, which yeah. are, some of which have great photos in them. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting thing to look at. Um, and certainly they were sort of a bit, sh it, it occurs to me sometimes when I was looking through some of the records and some of the police reports that they were a bit short of women to take with them. So some people were always getting the nod because there sort of weren't enough of them to, enough to go around, at least in, in the French Union that I, I looked at. Great. So, okay, we've got, we'll have a fi final call for questions. Anybody, or if uh, I'll just, if anybody just wants to wave, wave a hand at me, I will briefly mute you. I can't do that for our non video participants. Sorry, of course, you can't do that, but nobody is waving at me. So, I think, oh no, hang on, Eric is waving at me. Yeah, just very quickly, I see that it's been recorded. How would we access the recording? Because there's such a lot of very good information there. Oh, very good. You've, you've teed um, that up for me. Oh, sorry, carry on. Well, well um, basically, what's the situation about um, getting hold of stuff from the library during lockdown? So okay. Can we re-listen to the program, the lecture? Okay. Uh, yes, uh, we are uh, uploading all our recordings to our YouTube channel. So that is youtube.com forward slash WCM library. Uh, and I'll be aiming to get that up there later today. Although I am going straight into another meeting. So bear with me. It might be tomorrow morning. Uh, so uh, yeah, we, that gives you the opportunity to, uh, to if, you, if you arrive late, you can, you can um, pick up on the whole thing there. And plus also, Look at all the other ones that we've done. We've pulled together a, a page on the library website of resources that you can get to online, which are linked to, to the library collections. And that's wcml.org.uk forward slash explore from home. So that shows you the things that we have had digitized and the things that it is possible to get to. It is not currently possible, obviously, to get into the library yourself. If you want to drop us a line, if there's some, a, a particular photograph that you know that we have then then we may be able to sort that for you but in terms of sort of large scale scanning of, of whole documents and things we're, we're just not in a position to do that presence uh, sorry hope hope you appreciate that but please do drop us a line eric if, and, and we'll see, we'll see what we can do to help okay okay right i think i am going to say Thank you very much indeed. And I, I've already done my plug for the YouTube, um, but we would uh, we would very much uh, hope to be seeing you again this time next week. Our next speaker is Tim G, who is going to be talking on peace and equality, two sides of the same coin. And that will be at two o'clock next Wednesday. We do appreciate, we appreciate all our speakers who, who've uh, covered and we've got various of our previous speakers here today. So thank you very much to all of you, particularly thank you to Alison today for, for uh, coming on and, uh, and speaking to us about uh, sh shedding a light. This is called Invisible Histories and it is amazing what invisible stories come out from, uh, from these uh, fantastic people from our, from our past who we are, we are very pleased to know more about. So thanks very much, Alison. And um, I would just finish as usual with my appeal that um, if you're able to support the library, there is a donate button on our website and we'd much appreciate that though. We realize that there are a lot of other calls on your funds. So I will just sign off by saying, as I usually do, take care. <laughs>
in solidarity with best wishes from all at the Working Class Movement Library. Goodbye. Thank you, Lynette. Thanks for all your help as well. It's been a pleasure.